But yeah, welcome to this, what was supposed to be an end of year live stream, but didn't manage to do it last year. So we're doing it now. Um, and wanted to do this live stream to talk about the big themes that I observed in my 2023 from my YouTubing and in the podcast that I co-host, the Uptime Wind Energy podcast, and also through the consulting engineering work that I do through my company, Pardalo. Um, yeah, so I wanted to ask you guys, what do you think were the big energy transition stories of 2023? Or do you maybe have a prediction for the next year? Um, yeah, I usually don't like to make predictions for the year ahead because I just find it's not really enough time to make a prediction that's interesting but also accurate because, uh, yeah, anything that's going to happen in 2024 is probably already set in stone from what happened last year, so it won't be exciting to anyone. But maybe you've got a bold prediction to make. So I'll just start by thanking the sponsor of these live streams, which is WeatherGuard Lightning Tech. Um, sorry, WeatherGuard Lightning Tech. WeatherGuard make strike tape, a retrofitable lightning protection system for things that go fast, like wind turbine blades and aeroplanes. Okay, so I just wanted to also uh, start with a mention of Everything Electric Australia, which I posted in the comments. Um, I'm going to be there this year like I was last year. This year is promising to be even bigger and better than it was last year. Yeah, so anyway, I was talking about Everything Electric and the sessions that I'm going to be doing, EV myth busting what's next in the energy and transport transition, what are the best opportunities to decarbonize business and um, the next wave of new battery chemistries. Um, yeah, and the cool thing is that you can use my discount code, which is E-E-R-O-S-I-E, E-E-Rosie, and get a 20% discount. And um, Everything Electric are being really generous and sending all the money from ticket sales using that code back to me. So you can really support Engineering with Rosie if you buy tickets that way. So, yeah, also would love to see, um, yeah, love to see some of you guys there in person. I saw a few last year and uh, yeah, it's just really cool to, I don't know, it's a big difference between talking from behind a screen and actually seeing people in person and getting to chat. Um, okay, so I have a cool comment that I just want to raise here from Ping Nick. Some reports that sodium already is as good in life cycle as LFP batteries, mundane detail to some, but worth keeping tabs on for me, et cetera. And that is worth keeping tabs on. I am supposed to be getting a tour of a, a large sodium iron battery um, sometime around the middle of the year. Um, so that will be a topic to include in the video that I hope to make about that. Um, okay, I just got to bring up the screen again. Everything seems to be working this time, although maybe I just jinxed it. Uh, window, this one, yeah. Okay, so cool. All right, well, let's move on to the rest of what I wanted to talk about. So the first category I wanted to talk about is the podcast that I co-host each week with, uh, well, we're not all listed on here, but with um, Alan Hall and Joel Saxon and also um, Bill, who's not there. And so the big themes for 2023 in the podcast were wind industry woes. So what I wanted to share was this recent report from a CSIRO, Australian Science Organisation, and every couple of years they do a gen cost report where they look at the cost of different um, yeah, ways to generate electricity. And uh, it's an interesting report because they also include um, supporting technologies that you need to integrate a lot of variable renewables, so like transmission and storage. But the part of it that I wanted to show for this was that um, this little chart which shows how much the uh, different generation technologies have increased or decreased over the last couple of years. Um, so the light blue is 2023. Um, hold on, no, it's this one that I wanted to show. <laughs> the light blue is the cost increase or decrease from 22 to 23 and then dark blue 23 to 24. Um, and you can see that yeah, last year uh, nearly everything increased, but wind the most, 35%. There isn't offshore wind on this just because Australia doesn't have any yet, but it would have been an even greater increase. 
Um, so yeah, that explains a lot of the wind industry woes. Um, the issues that we've been seeing have been like, a lot of um, yeah issues with auctions in the US and the UK. In the US, a lot of projects have been cancelled or the developers are trying to renegotiate the terms of the contracts after they won the auction but before they actually got locked into costs for delivering. Um, the reason for these, these the need to, to do that is that a lot of the projects became unprofitable based on the increased costs from yeah, I don't know, coming out of COVID and the war in Ukraine and yeah, just general supply chain worries um, that affected wind industry more than most other kinds of um, generation. Um, yeah, and I actually saw that in the US, it's I think it's up to 50% of auctions or projects won at auction uh, either cancelled or being renegotiated. So it's a huge big deal. And then in the UK, their most recent auction, there were absolutely zero bidders. Um, but I think that the outlook for the next year or two moving forward is a lot more positive. You can see that the cost increase is expected to go, you know, back down still high, higher than it has been in the past when we saw decreases every year, but back down to something manageable. And in the UK, they have rejigged the rules around the, the next version of the auction, increase the price they're willing to pay. So I think we'll get back on track, but that was a big theme for 2023. Um, and then onshore, there were big issues with wind turbine blade defects. Um, it was with uh, with a lot of different manufacturers, but the main ones that were in the news were TPI and Siemens Gamesa. Um, so I've just done a Google search on the defects cost because it kind of started out where they're like, oh yeah, this could cost a billion dollars. And then it eventually went up to you know, like, well, one and a half, two and a half, 4.5 billion. I think I saw it at five or so um, estimate that's what it's going to cost to fix all of these defects. It was stuff like um, wrinkles in wind turbine blades and foreign particles in uh, bearings for their onshore wind turbines. So that's a big thing still to watch. And I don't think that Siemens Gamesa is fully through that yet. Um, yeah, so that's what I wanted to say about that. Oh, and also I, um, as well as talking about that a lot on the Uptime Wind Energy podcast, I also was a guest on Redefining Energy, which is one of my favourite um, favorite energy podcasts that I listen to. And uh, yeah, it was episode 180. If you want to look that up, it was very interesting because the hosts of that show, uh, Laurent and Gerard, are finance guys, um, not within the wind industry. So we definitely had a a very robust discussion about what we thought the cause of these issues were and whether they're going to go, um, yeah, to get better in the future. So I think that that one is a very interesting one to listen to if you like podcasts. Okay, so let's take a look at some comments. Echo is gone. That's, that's the best one. Finally seems to be back on track for this podcast. Um, okay, we've got what looks like a prediction for 2024 from Stephen Cooper, hoping global CO2 emissions peak or decline in 2024. So, yeah, I, I wonder about that. I think we might be optimistic on that one. I know that I think that China is expecting to peak in within the next five or so years, but maybe not quite yet. And I think that, um, yeah, I don't know if you need probably both China and the US to peak to, to see a global peak overall. Um, so I would love for that to happen, but I think it might be a year or two early on that one. Um, Richard Warren says, looks like solar is recovering and costs are now moving down. Yeah, I think for solar, it was much more of a like really sh short and sharp blip. Um, solar has a way more downward pressure on their um, general cost curve, I, I think. Um, you know, I could spend ages talking about why, why, well, what the differences are between wind and solar and why that is. But I think that wind is probably getting closer to, you know, a more flat part of their cost reduction curve. And we might be wise to stop assuming that you can bid for a project one year and then by the time you actually have to deliver it that um, prices will have gone down so much that you can make your profit from that. I, I think it might be a bit more like a traditional infrastructure project moving forward. Um, okay, what other comments have we got? <laughs> 
Okay, prediction for 2024 from Alan Hall, my podcast co-host. Hi, Alan. Uh, 2024, Australia gets a wind uh, manufacturing facility. Um, I'm sure we will of some kind. It, I, I'm always so sceptical about you know, Australia and what they call manufacturing and, and I'm super cynical about that. Like, yeah, sure, we'll probably make some tower sections or more than we do already or something like that. But anything major, I would love to see that, but don't think so. Um, yeah, uh, okay. And one from um, Nadeem Ahmed. What do you think of Australia's battery investment scheme? I think that things are, Australia is starting to realise what needs to be done with, with batteries. I am really excited about adding, um, yeah, more, getting more of the battery manufacturing value in Australia. You know, we already mine um, most of the, the minerals that go into batteries and I see a lot of really good projects um, at the next stage you know a little bit of processing um, I think that that's a really good step and I do I'm starting to see some sensible government support related to that so yeah early days and uh, I don't know we've had so many times I've, I've, you know I've been an engineer for nearly 20 years and you know you constantly see governments try to encourage manufacturing in Australia and it never works out. But I, I do get the impression that, you know, like we've got such a good potential and um, we might be starting to see some, some capabilities to take advantage of that. Um, okay, one more question, which I, I never normally discuss this. <laughs> Ali says, I was shocked to learn Australia has no nuclear power. What's behind this? Uh, it is illegal in Australia. You, you can't actually, yeah, according to the law, we can't have any nuclear power. Um, so we'd have to change the law to get that. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's, this is the reason why I <laughs> never talk about it because you open a big can of worms and um, it's all political and complicated. But basically, yeah, we would need a change in law. Um, We've got, you know, two major parties, the, the left and the right. Left are pretty anti-nuclear. The right say that they're pro-nuclear, but they're only ever pro-nuclear when they're not in government. So, you know, they were in government until a couple of years ago. They had 10 years in government or thereabouts, did nothing <laughs> towards starting a nuclear industry. And now that they're in opposition, they um, won't stop carrying on about starting a nuclear industry. So I don't think that anybody thinks that that's a legitimate solution for Australia. The fact is that we're going to have 82% renewable electricity in Australia by 2030, which will be wind and solar um, plus the hydro that we've already got. And that is way sooner than we can get any nuclear industry up. So by the time we would have any nuclear power, um, we, you know, would have gone most of the way to a renewable energy system anyway. Nuclear and variable renewables don't play that well together. And then the final political thing that I will say is that I think most countries that have nuclear power also have nuclear weapons and Australia does not. And so we don't have that kind of natural subsidy. So that's uh, <laughs> that's what I will say about nuclear. I'm considering making a video about nuclear in Australia um, to make some of those points a bit better. Um, yeah, H2 writers commented, nuclear is slow to build and too expensive. And uh, I think that that is... Um, a good summary, as long as you include compared to wind and solar and energy storage, because the fact is that Australia just has those things in such abundance, that's why nuclear doesn't make sense here. Uh, I'm not anti-nuclear at all. I just, compared to the alternatives that we have to have zero emissions grid, we will get there faster and cheaper with the other stuff um, than nuclear. So, yeah, that's my comments. <laughs> on nuclear, which like I said, I usually just ignore any comments related to nuclear, but there you go. I felt like doing it today. Um, okay, so next topic that I wanted to do for my 2023 was um, the consulting work that I do. And in consulting work I do for my company, Padlote, one of the big themes of 2023 has been long duration energy storage. So there's a lot of a lot of my clients are looking into all sorts of um, of yeah long duration energy storage technologies, and there are a lot of projects actually underway now in many categories. Um, so it actually maybe this is a, a prediction <laughs> that I will make for 2024 is that. Um, 2024 will be the year of long duration energy storage because a lot of things that are kind of in place now will be coming online in 24 or shortly afterwards. Um, so let me 
show some of those projects now. So in Australia, we've got the 250 megawatt Kidston pump hydro storage project. This is a really cool one um, for a few different reasons. So it's already in construction. It's supposed to be completed in 2024. And assuming that it is, it's going to be the first pumped hydro project completed in Australia in 40 years. Um, yeah, the other one in construction at the moment is Snowy Hydro 2.0, and that is just, you know, delays and delays and delays. So I'm pretty sure that Kidston's going to win. Um, it's also the first one ever to be completed by the private sector. All right, so that's um, there's other pumped, um, pumped hydro stuff happening now. Uh, I, I was feeling, until I started researching pumped hydro for, yeah, for my consulting work, I was feeling really negative about it because Snowy Hydro gets all the press and it's just going so badly. Um, yeah, but when I looked into it, I, actually, it seems to be just Snowy Hydro that's, <laughs> that's going badly and uh, a lot of the smaller projects uh, seem to be going well and I think that that's yeah, really good news because that's how you get the really like big bulk of um, yeah, that puts the long and long duration energy storage. Okay, so next one I want to talk about is iron air batteries. So Form Energy has entered into an agreement with Georgia Power to deploy 15 megawatts and 1.5 gigawatt hours. So that's 100 hours of iron air battery in Georgia. That's the state in the United States, not the country. Um, and that's predicted to enter commercial operations in 2026. They've also partnered with Xcel Energy um, to deploy iron air batteries at retiring coal plant sites in Minnesota and Colorado, and they're both 10 megawatts, 1,000 megawatt hours. Um, and those ones will be online hopefully a little bit earlier, 2025, um, uh, subject to regulatory approvals. So that's really interesting. I would I would super duper love to <laughs> go, uh, yeah, do a tour of Form Energy and um, find, yeah, have take a look at their battery and how it works. I've heard a few uh, interviews with one of the founders and I just love their approach um, that they have to solving this problem um, and technology development. So yeah, if anybody... <laughs> anybody knows them, knows anyone from that company and can hook, a, hook up an introduction, I would love to make a video on that. Um, okay, next technology I want to cover is um, for, uh, for long duration energy storage is compressed air. So Hydrostore has um, a few compressed air projects um, and one of them is in Australia at Broken Hill. They have um, a 200 megawatt, 1600 megawatt hour project planned for Broken Hill. Um, what I was saying about this project at Broken Hill is that they're building this energy storage in preference to upgrading transmission. So I think that that is very topical at the moment because around the world people are finding it hard to build transmission projects and I think it really exemplifies that aspect of the energy transition that everything kind of interrelates with everything and you know solutions problems and solutions aren't always obvious um yeah so that's that's what i wanted to say about that um there's also there's there's so many other projects that i haven't included here um lithium ion batteries are getting bigger sodium ion batteries as we briefly briefly talked about are going to be doing more oh and also um flow batteries there's some big flow batteries that especially in china has some like huge flow batteries um that they yeah that they have in installed and are operating hard to really find out a lot about those ones though um yeah uh one other one i have discussed on this channel before i should have brought up link for it but energy vault you know that um company that did gravity energy storage and they like haul blocks up and stack them up like a jenga tower and then generate energy when they're going down um and then you know if you follow the company they seem to have quietly pivoted away from that into just you know regular battery energy storage but they do actually have at least one maybe two really big versions of their big block stacking crane um winch generator thing um planned in in china so again it's really hard to actually see a lot of details of projects that happen in china but it is interesting to see that somebody somebody wanted to buy their their crazy gravity energy storage project 
Okay, so that's all I want to say about long duration energy. Let's see what comments that we might get. Um, okay, here's a good one. Another one from um, Nadeem Ahmed. Oops. Do you think Australia will be able to make a green steel industry by the 2030s? Yes, I do think so. I'm optimistic about this one. Um, green steel is another topic I am going to talk about later in this live stream, though not in Australia. I think it is by far the preferable way to use all our green electricity and our iron ore, you know, makes more sense to instead of digging up the dirt, sending it to China, buying the steel back again, um, and then taking our renewable energy and turning that into hydrogen and shipping it off, it, it makes much more sense to just make the steel here and, um, yeah, keep it here and send it around the world. So I, one, think that we need to do this, and two, I am actually legitimately optimistic that we will we will do that. Um, okay, so the final category that I wanted to talk about today for my 2023 was YouTube. Um, yeah, so... One thing that I talked about quite a lot in 2023 was um, industrial emissions. So I did most recently, I did video on green, um, oh, no, on industrial heat. Um, this one, if you haven't watched it, then you can in the near future, I hope. Um, but I also did like aluminium and cement and what else? Uh, steel. Um, and I have started to see I mean this is a topic that's been really interesting to me for a while I think because you know I work for so long with renewable electricity generation um this you know the in industrial emissions was kind of new and exciting for me and just personally interesting so I've been making videos on that for a while we can take a look at a couple of companies that I've covered on the channel before um there's been some good progress with um with steel so there's a couple of couple of companies that have done some fundraising recently so the first is Boston Metal um, so yeah Boston Metal closed a 262 million series C funding round for their molten oxide electrolysis process recently um, yeah their CEO said our high value metals business is nearing commercialization at our subsidiary in Brazil with our manufacturing facility opening this autumn and they're making significant progress in the scale up of MOE for green steel production at a pilot plant outside of Boston that's the one that I toured um, their progress is that they are apparently on track to ship their first metals in 2024 so this year uh, I guess that's another 2024 prediction. Um, and they ex expect to have a commercial product by 2026. So that is, uh, yeah, I mean, they're, they're front runner for that, for that type of uh, green steel. Then this is another one that I have covered before, the Swedish H2 green steel, and they raised one and a half billion euros this year. So what was Boston Metal was 262 million. So yeah, no, not quite like five times as much for the hydrogen version. Um, and they raised that in equity to build the world's first green steel plant. And they've already actually commenced construction on that a few years ago, but now they're set for funding to get them to the start of operations at the end of 2025. So the hydrogen route to green steel is the easier one, technologically speaking, might be hard to scale up um, in terms of uh, yeah, actually getting the, the volume of uh, green hydrogen that they need. Um, yeah, but that is some decent progress. Oh, I just realized I wasn't sharing my screen. But anyway, that's the um, H2 Green Steel um, project. Uh, yeah, so it's a, Europe's first gigastale electrolyzer to make green hydrogen for, yeah, really big green steel. And they've got customers like in the auto industry and um, a few others. And then this is the Boston Metal one. Yeah. Okay. So I think that's um, that was my 2023. Anyway, those were the those are the themes for me. I guess I expect some of the same coming up. Um, but I'm interested to hear. You know, is there anything you think that I missed? Um, yeah. And I guess another theme for 2023 was just really bad technical problems every time I live stream. And I, I have to say that's why I stopped doing it so often because um, it really is not enjoyable to keep on pushing through this. Um, Peter Ross says, weather is hammering internet connections. That's probably it today. It is, um, yeah, it's 
pissing down here at the moment. So that's probably possibly what it is. Although I do get the impression that it's actually the studio, not the internet, because it's only only this just keeps on kicking me out of the studio, which it normally doesn't do if I lose my internet connection. So I'm very familiar with that. Okay. Um, here's an interesting prediction from Stephen Brickwood. Population collapse is likely in some countries and so may CO2 and pressure to go green may ease. I don't know if that's a 2024 prediction and I hope not, I hope not. but I, I was thinking that with countries like China and Japan, um, who have big challenges with their energy transition for different reasons that both of them have declining populations. I think uh, Korea is another one that's got you know, really quickly, <laughs> rapidly decreasing population. Um, it is, yeah, it is surely going to affect uh, affect that. The problem won't continue to get harder as fast as it is now, but I think it's also a bit too slow. We need to you know, really, really, really turn this around in the next decade. Um, okay, another good question from uh, Nadim. Will you do a video on green plastic industry? I, I was thinking of doing a video tentatively tidying plastics versus climate change or something like that because I think the interesting question with plastics is how much um, I think a lot of the solutions to plastic waste are intention with solutions to climate change like they can actually make each other worse and I never hear people talking about that I always see seem to uh, I see people who seem to think that um, reducing plastic use is, is also uh, you know a climate solution when in fact it's actually often uh, the opposite um, okay more questions um, Okay, on Boston Metal, maybe I think I was cutting in and out while I was talking about that, that so it's not surprised that you didn't hear everything I said. Uh, yeah, for Boston Metal, when will they make it to large-scale production? They're going to ship some small amounts this year, and I think it was uh, 2026 that they're um, – where is it? Uh, just rigging out my notes here. Yeah, uh, some commercial volume, so 2026. So it's not far to wait. And I think, I mean, I still see steel um, mentioned as, you know, uh, an example of a hard to decarbonize sector. The more that I research these hard to decarbonize sectors, the more I find that there, there aren't many that are actually hard to decarbonize. It is mainly the problem that they're hard to cheaply decarbonize. So, for example, um, for cement, that's the that's the issue. And I don't know, so, so many other examples. Like we're really lucky that for electricity generation, um, we have got renewables that are, you know, a lot, large part of the problem can be solved with solutions that are cheaper than the incumbent technologies, but it's not true for everything. And those are going to be the interesting parts of the, the transition. Um, okay. This one for Precious. Catch you later with the edited version. That is absolutely fair. But it takes a couple of days to um, cut it all out. So, yeah. All right. Um, what else have we got in the comments? Stephen Brickwood says, off-grid for the home may be a real option as EVs and rooftop PV roll out. I think, yes, people will be going mostly off-grid, but you can't beat the grid for... Uh, you know, emergency use. It's, it's a really actually maintaining a good connection is a really cheap way to um, get that reliability for your occasional, you know, sunless week or, or whatever. Um, so, yeah, I think it will be a, a theme for, I don't know, maybe, maybe not this year, but maybe in the next few years we are going to have to think of more just ways to pay for the electricity network rather than at the moment I think in most countries you pay along with your usage so if you use very little electricity you pay very little for the um, electricity grid but it's not a fair way to do it if um, you know people with rooftop solar are uh, only using it on occasion it's immensely valuable to them and they'll be paying almost nothing so I, I think we are going to see need to see some changes to that um Okay, present question from Alan Hall, which I think you might be using. We, we spoke earlier today, and I think that he um, might be using some insider knowledge to ask this question. What about blade recycling for 2024? 
that is the topic of my next video. I'm currently editing that. There is some really, really exciting progress in wind turbine blade recycling uh, coming up. A lot of the manufacturers have made real progress on um, projects related to that. And yeah, the video goes through, well, it goes through why the problem is hard to start with, then all the different ways that you can recycle, recycle wind turbine blades or people are trying to, and then finally actual progress towards that goal. So you can look out for that. Um, okay, there's too many comments to get through now. I will read them all before I um, close this window. Thanks so much to everybody who joined and persevered through all of these um, technical issues. That's got to be surely a world record for, um, yeah, for technical problems in a live stream. I have to give a big thank you for uh, the Engineering with Rosie Patreon team who supported, uh, yeah, the, the whole 2023 and will support 2024. It's a big uh it makes a big difference i actually just went through the financials i shared that information on my patreon page my um yeah the funding for the channel is basically an even split between youtube ads sponsors and patreon so it's making um yeah a big difference and really allows me to make videos that you know go more in depth and maybe have less of a mass appeal than what i would have to do if i was relying solely on youtube views to pay for the channel so huge thanks to everyone there oh and um I have got a link that I can show. Where is it? There. You can join um, Patreon at that link. I don't know if you can see that. It's also in the description. Um, thank again, um, WeatherGuard, the sponsor of these live streams. They also have a great tech newsletter, which you can sign up to with a link in the description. And, of course, a podcast, which I've mentioned several times. Um, yeah, we talk about all kinds of clean energy tech news and the latest one was on some of the topics I mentioned earlier, New York's delayed and cancelled offshore wind contracts and the effects that that's going to have on future electricity demand. Um, and if I recall correctly, in this episode, I actually go off on quite a lengthy rant about um, <laughs> New Yorkers being childish about new energy sources, thinking that they can just rule out offshore wind, onshore wind, nuclear, new transmission, and, you know, rule out all of those and still think that they are have a viable path to be able to transition away from fossil fuels. I think that some people need to, to get real and, uh, yeah, start negotiating properly to, you know, make uh, make their energy transition happen rather than just talk about it. Um, we also talk about new port facilities and also um, a bit about wind turbines and bird collisions and a new project to um, do more of the idea of painting a blade black to reduce bird collisions. So more evidence will be found whether that works or not um yep that's it so thank you very much for everyone that stayed and persevered through the problems and i'll be back for another live stream in a few weeks i want to do one with um uh, on industrial heat with paul martin who's been on the channel before who works a lot with those kinds of technologies and has you know for, for decades so yeah if you have questions for that then Put them here or in the industrial heat video and if you have suggestions for future videos for this year then please put them in the comments too um yep so thanks and i'll see you later